Hello, and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today I'm looking at the collection of the 2009 series, X-Force Cable, Messiah War. Messiah War is the second part of the loose trilogy of X-Men comics set around the coming of a mutant messiah that started in 2007 with Messiah Complex and ends in 2011 with Second Coming. To be honest, Messiah War definitely feels like the middle child here. While the first and third stories run through all the primary X-Men books running at the time, War only jumps back and forth between issues of Cable and X-Force, both of which only started during the fallout from Complex. And the only information you even need to know from that earlier story is that Cable has managed to save the first mutant child born since the House of M event that depowered most of the mutants in the world from all the various factions trying to claim her. He did this by taking her into the future where she can grow up without worrying about the expected destiny of the supposed mutant messiah. But Bishop, another mutant born in an apocalyptic future brought about by this messiah, wants her dead in order to prevent that future from ever happening. So he follows Cable and the baby into the future. And that's about as far as this story ties in to either of the book ending parts of this trilogy. So it might be arguable that it really even is a part of the trilogy at all but I guess I'll let you decide that for yourself as we take this away. The story opens on Cable and the mutant baby trying to survive in a harsh post-apocalyptic future. The baby has grown into a young girl that Cable has named Hope after a young woman that was originally helping him raise the child. Hope the Elder and the world around them are all dead due to the work of Bishop. Unsure of how to track the pair in the future, he instead decides to try to bring them to him. So he sets about creating an apocalypse of his own, creating one disaster after another in different time periods so that whatever future Cable ends up in, he's going to end up forced out of it. And this succeeds as in the distant future timeline Cable does end up in, humanity begins blending their DNA with that of cockroaches in order to be able to survive all the disasters Bishop has created. But this has the standard horror movie effect of turning people into giant cockroach monsters, and the roach people become hellbent on eliminating normal human beings, and on one of their attacks, they manage to kill Mama Hope. The remnants of humanity, with Cable's help, are able to fight them off for a time, until they get down to their last resort. A bomb that should be able to wipe out all of the roach people at once. Cable warns against using the bomb, but with the roaches closing in, the last people don't feel like they have much of a choice. So Cable gathers up Hope, the younger, and jumps into the future as the scientists set off the bomb. Spoiler alert, it kills everything. And unfortunately, everything stays dead for a really long time. Cable's device that lets him time travel is unfortunately broken, so he's only able to jump further into the future. Because of this, he's forced to keep jumping further and further into the future, as every jump he makes still sees the Earth dead from the bug bomb. Finally, he ends up in a future with life, but it's the future where Apocalypse has taken over. For those who don't know, Apocalypse, or in Saba Nur, is the first mutant ever, born back in ancient Egypt. His mutant ability seems to make him immortal, and so he survives into this far off future where he is able to gain total dominance over the entire world. This is the future Cable actually grew up in, and somewhere he never wanted to return. Luckily, he's safe from having to face this future alone, because once Cyclops realized something was wrong, he sent X-Force into the future to help Cable out and bring Hope home. Their name still appears when they enter a room, I see. God, I'm so jelly. This plan immediately hits a snag when one of the team tries to return home by removing his time travel armband that is keeping him in the future, but nothing happens. This problem is further compounded when they discover their teleporter also can't... teleport. His name, by the way, is Telford Porter. Yeah. Telford Porter. Teleporter. <sighs> I just want to say, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby did a lot of great things for comics. Naming this character was not one of them. Realizing something is blocking their ability to leave, X-Force is forced to work with Cable to invade Apocalypse's fortress so they can all get out of there. Only before they can go anywhere, they're stopped by a sniper. A sniper that turns out to be everyone's favorite Merc with a mouth and member of earlier versions of X-Force, Deadpool. He's really in right now. He's able to be in this future world due to his healing factor, which is even more powerful than Wolverine's, having managed to keep him alive through all the centuries. He also claims that at some point in our near future, he ducked into some kind of industrial freezer to avoid nuclear fallout. 
taking a jab at Kingdom of the Crystal Skull while doing so, and ended up being stuck down there alone for all this time, making him even more crazy than he already was before. Well, no, that's probably not possible. Domino, his old teammate, is suspicious of him the entire time, accusing him repeatedly of hiding something, and it's possible she's right to be suspicious, as there does always seem to be something a little off about what he's saying. He even, at one point, mentions the Roach people, though he shouldn't even know about them if his story of being locked away was true. Deadpool does provide some helpful exposition, though, explaining that it's not Apocalypse in the Fortress, it's Cable's old arch enemy, Butter Knife. Oh, uh, I mean Strife. It's Strife. Sorry, I was reading the wrong dialogue box. Strife is a clone of Cable, who was abducted as a child and raised by Apocalypse as a potential host body for him to transfer his soul into. I guess this is kind of how Apocalypse is actually able to live forever? I, I don't know man, Apocalypse is an enigma. Since Strife is a clone though, not a real boy, Apocalypse saw him as not a suitable host. This makes Strife, who's already messed up from his upbringing, even more resentful of Cable and now lives his life with only two goals to get revenge on Cable and Apocalypse. Bishop found Strife, who was supposed to be dead, and offered him both of his enemies if he agreed to help Bishop stop Cable. Bishop is able to do this because he found Apocalypse in some kind of stasis sleep chamber in the future, and realizing he'd be in a weakened state, knew he could be killed. So Bishop and Strife worked together to take down Apocalypse, and then assume control over the future that was originally his. Still following me? Time travel is complicated enough, but to even have this story in the first place, we have to basically retcon like six different pre-established futures into this bizarre mix of things just to bring Cable and Strife back into conflict. It's... oof. I guess to be fair though, you don't really need to know most of that in order to read this comic. While it would be helpful to know Cable's backstory, Bishop's backstory, and the X-Men's history with Apocalypse, most of the relevant information is explained in this story. It's probably enough that you understand that these characters have history where they all hate each other. Anything beyond that you need to know is basically just the most recent history of the characters, and that's mostly covered in the Messiah War one-shot that opens the collection, where they explain what Bishop's been doing in the events of Messiah Complex. And it's all done to some absolutely gorgeous art. I mean seriously, goddamn. This introductory issue, sadly alone, was done by artist Mike Choi and colorist Sonia Oba, who had worked together before on titles such as X-23, Target X, and Witchblade, and their collaboration is clearly a good thing. As far as I can tell, this art isn't digitally created, but it sure looks like it, and like a really high quality version of it too. In fact, whatever I may think of the rest of the story, the art on this series as a whole is pretty impressive throughout. Clayton Crane, whose work I adored on the Garth Ennis written Ghost Rider series, was the artist for the volume of X-Force running during this story arc, and it's always great getting to see his work, though I will say it's clearly still too dark for its own good. The weakest link here is definitely Ariel Olivetti, the artist for Cable. Most of his work is still pretty strong, though I feel like his characters tend to look really stiff and have kind of awkward looking poses. On top of that, the colors look super washed out. This would have been fine, I guess, when they were stuck traveling through a desert, as it kind of emphasizes the sun and the heat, but at that point, for some reason, the coloring was actually being done by what I'm assuming is a company called Guru EFX, and looked completely different. It pretty much is only in this washed out style while they're in the apocalypse future, which I honestly find kind of weird. Possibly this was done because they thought it would more closely resemble the rest of the art, but it's still a pretty glaring contrast with all that bright, washed outness, and some of it I just really don't like. The rest of the story sees Strife kidnapping Hope and slowly figuring out her importance by how the others are treating her. This puts Hope in grave danger, but since Strife is a clone of Cable looking just like him, she doesn't realize it and actually assumes he is Cable. So the team splits up into two groups, with most of them going off to deal with whatever has locked them into their time, while Cable and Wolverine try to rescue Hope. The Time Lock team discover that what's holding them there is a mutant. X-23 recognizes her as Kaiden Nixon, the main character of the short-lived series NYX, the very series that X-23 got her first ever canon appearance in. Though they don't really ever fully explain how Kaiden is still alive, her power of being able to freeze time is what's locking everyone in place. 
X can't bring herself to harm her old friend, but Domino puts her out of her misery with a bullet to the head. Cable and Wolverine, meanwhile, are busy trying to defeat Strife, but even when Deadpool runs off from the other group to bring a giant cannon to the fight, they find themselves unable to save the day. So the day, instead, is actually saved, rather unexpectedly, by Apocalypse. It seems Bishop, in Strife, hadn't managed to actually kill him, just left him mostly dead. Angel, who had been infected by Apocalypse by something that allows him to turn himself into the Horseman of Death, called Archangel, finds Apocalypse in a cave, clinging to the last vestiges of life, and decides, I'll restore him to strength. Maybe not the best idea, but I guess it worked out. Powered up again, he easily defeats Strife. He also instantly realizes Hope's importance to history, but before he can do anything about it, Angel demands he spare her, trading the life he already restored to Apocalypse for the life of the girl. Apocalypse agrees, and the comic ends with Cable and Hope jetting off to yet another time period, and everybody else returning home. Also, we see Bishop having escaped punishment, swearing he will find the girl again, meaning after all this mess, we're exactly back where we started. Which just leaves us with a breakdown. I think my biggest problem with this series has to lie in the basic conflict of it. While pretty understated, I can't help but be uncomfortable with the subtext of Cable as the supposed hero and Bishop as the villain. Marvel's mutants have pretty much always been used as a sort of soft allegory for racism, and Bishop, being also black, somewhat doubly so for that. But Bishop goes full-on villain here, destroying entire civilizations with callous abandon, with the justification that it would all cease to exist anyway if he manages to kill Hope and prevent the future that she creates. Even without that, though, there's not much I like about the story. Maybe really long-time fans of these characters might see the story as a big payoff for the characters, because that's certainly how they wrote it. Just look at how in the opening one-shot, they spent the whole issue disguising Strife's appearance, only to reveal it as a big splash page on the final page. I mean, if you knew all about Strife's history leading up to this, that was probably an exciting reveal, right? I, on the other hand, had never heard of Strife before reading this comic, so what did I really care? So to me, this comic mostly just feels a little spastic, without much of a story being developed. Also, really, aside from including Hope and being a multi-title story arc, I'm not sure this story really has anything to do with the other two stories in this supposed trilogy. It's not really a bad story or comic on its own, but it seems like it should have just been one short story arc of the Cable comic instead of trying to build it up as an event of its own. At least the art is nice. So that's why I'm giving this series a recommendation level of... Low. If you're really into Cable and Apocalypse stories, then go for it. Otherwise, you don't need to read the story to read Messiah Complex or Second Coming, and I don't see it having much appeal for anyone else. Also, the collected edition gets one Mutant M brand. It's a little hard to tell because I could only find one digital version online, which I can't guarantee is the same as any physical version, but there aren't really any bonuses in this collection, other than including the prequel issue and the pages that were in that issue that give you some background on the characters. But these clearly say Strife's files, whereas the back cover clearly says Cable's files, and also that you get to see Cable's arsenal, even though neither of those seem to be in the digital collection. At least it does place each issue cover before each issue, which is the way I always prefer it. Thanks everybody for watching! It's 2020 now! Yay! This channel has been steadily growing, so please help me out by spreading the word and clicking on the subscribe button on the left side of the screen. Let's make 2020 a kick-ass year for comics and this channel. Then be sure to stick around for next week when I cover the final portion of this trilogy with X-Men Second Coming. Hope to see you then, right here in the Comic Cave.